Good morning, ladies. It's a snowy day in Montana. I hope that you're warm wherever you are as you listen to this. Today we're continuing in the book of James, chapter 3, um, and we're going to be talking about something that nobody wants to talk about, and that is our tongues, our mouths, and how difficult it is to control that. You know, James has been talking about the tongue already in both the first and second chapters of his letter here. In chapter 1, verse 19, he said we should be slow to speak. Um, in, also in uh, verse 26 of the first chapter, he said we should bridle our tongues. In chapter 2, he told us that our words matter uh, because if our words and our works or our deeds don't line up, then that's a problem. And so today he's going to talk a lot more directly about the tongue in the context of the teacher as well as all of us. Um, but I was thinking about this this first verse in context of the teacher. Um, what sort of professions did you hope your kids might get into as adults? You know, when you had young kids at home, you know, did you have a desire that they would grow up to be something specific? I think of Waylon and Willie, their song, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. And I'm thinking, why not? What should they be instead? Well, I think um, maybe a lot of us, if we were honest, we were looking for a high-paying profession for our kids. Um, and here is James giving us a little bit of, uh, it, it appears to be some career counseling. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, let's, let's read just the first two verses of James 3. Not many of you should presume to become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all strumble, stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So, not many should presume to become teachers. Um, maybe you were hoping that your children would grow up to be teachers, but probably you were thinking, well, yeah, in, in, a, um, in a schoolroom setting. But James here is speaking of teachers in the church. Uh, it could be pastors. It could be um, Sunday school teachers. It could be Bible study leaders. So this makes me very nervous to teach this uh, passage today because it steps all over my toes. The, uh, the thing that James is doing here is, is he's just warning those of us who do use our tongues to teach God's word that we'd better be on the alert. Humility should be the heart of, it, of the teacher. Um, and when the NIV says not many of you should presume to become teachers, it carries that idea of a presumption that you'd be great at it. And, um, and that, well, of course, everybody wants to hear me teach because I have so many words. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing to... Um, to have, have that kind of perception about our own abilities to teach. It says, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Um, it doesn't say not any. It just says not many. So there should be some serious um, consideration as to the requirements, but also the... Um, the, the outcome and, and the potential judgment on those of us who are teachers. Matthew uh, chapter 7 makes it quite clear that uh, judge for the, with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So as teachers, as a teacher, I want to make sure that I'm teaching God's Word accurately and then practice what I teach. 
it's it's very clear that our church leaders are held to a higher standard. Matthew 5.17 says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The idea here is of a teacher who relaxes some of God's commands in order to um, accommodate the people that, that they're teaching. That's happening quite frequently in churches all over the place today, where um, the leadership, the, the, the teachers, the preachers are accommodating sinful lifestyles, uh, and in under the name of compassion, I'm sure, but it is um, a dangerous thing to do because Jesus himself said that um, if we do relax the commands of God, and um, it, it will be a very heavy price that the teacher will pay. Matthew 18, verse 6 Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That one has always held me very much in, um, in focus. Uh, the idea of, you know, it's not just speaking of children. It's speaking of someone who's young in the faith that my teaching might encourage them to, to um, sin. And that would be, uh, uh, the, the consequence of that, a great millstone fastened around my neck, drowned in the depths of the sea, would be Jesus' idea of justice for me. Uh, and it's very, very, very scary Luke twelve forty eight again, Jesus says, Everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand even more. So there is a heavy responsibility that is carried as a teacher, as a leader, making sure that I am teaching what is... What is it, exactly what the word says to not alter it in any way to not water it down to um, to not be afraid to speak the truth and to handle the word of God with great care and integrity verse 2 reminds us that we all mess up even those who lead others spiritually and we already know quite well that nobody is perfect this understanding and admission um, requires a great deal of humi humility that, that we recognize our vulnerability to um, allow our teaching, our uh, preaching, our influence to be anything other than um, what God is calling for in Scripture. Then we move on in this chapter and and it's still speaking to, uh, to the tongue and to what comes out of our mouths. But it's, it's beginning to uh, widen the scope beyond just the teaching situation. Now, let me just read a few verses here, starting at verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses and make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, setting the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. So uh, we see some interesting um, analogies here, and we're, it looks like we're 
James must have been writing this on a summer vacation in northwest northwest Montana uh, because we've got horseback riding, boating, and campfires. And so it's it's a very these are very familiar analogies to all of us. Uh, but what James is doing is very interesting by taking something very, very small, like the bit is small relative to the size of the horse's body. The rudder is small relative to the size of the ship. And so in the same way, thinking about the tongue, it's a very small part of the body, but then the the consequences of what that very small thing can do relative to the size of the body is very, very um, scary, actually. He, it seems that he is uh, saying that controlling the tom, tongue is important to the whole entirety of my life. Even though it's so small compared to the rest of my body, you wouldn't think it was the most important. But he seems to be saying that the words that we speak have more impact than any of us cares to admit, and that they have implication for every single aspect of my life. He is saying that if I can control what I say, I can control what I do. Do you know that, um, do you know why the doctor, when you come in for a checkup, the doctor looks at your tongue and says, stick out your tongue. They're looking at your tongue because your tongue is a roadmap and it, it reveals things about the health of the body. In the same way, the words that we say with our tongue reveal a lot about our whole being. So James is talking about um, abusive and slanderous talking and it, it may ab actually even include excessive talking. Proverbs ten nineteen says, Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Now that's pretty practical talk, right? In Ecclesiastes we read, To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Uh, according to... Um, the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, he says the sacrifice of fools is humanly initiated religious talk. In Ecclesiastes, it continues, don't be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, because God is in heaven and you are upon the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. I think about when um, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain uh, and was transfigured before them. Moses and Elijah appeared to be carrying on a conversation with Jesus, but Peter interrupts and, and, and it says he's answering. And he says, if you will, I will make three shelters. So it, it's not like somebody told him to do it. Nobody was even speaking to Peter, but he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. He was offering the sacrifice of fools. And so there is such great wisdom in just being quiet and not thinking that we need to offer our opinion or just offer someone yesterday called it useless prattle. Um, the, the, um, there's, there's a time to speak and a time to shut up. And um, the, the speaking needs to be words that are uh, carefully selected because often we speak, we, I think we speak out of nervousness sometimes um, because it just feels like it's uncomfortable to have silence. Um, but also one reason uh, is, again, in Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, one reason we can hardly bear to remain silent is that it makes us feel so helpless. We're so accustomed to relying upon words to manage and control others. If we're silent, who will take control? Well, 
God will take control. But we will never let him take control until we trust him. Silence is intimately related to trust. And another thing about our tongue is that it is a powerful weapon of manipulation. Foster says, A frantic stream of words flows from us because we are in a constant process of adjusting our public image. We fear so deeply what we think other people see in us, so we talk in order to straighten out their understanding. If I've done something wrong and discover that you know about it, I will be very tempted to help you understand my actions. So it's actually um, uh, a very important thing that we control these small little parts of our body because of the obvious uh, damage that it can do. Again, with James' analogies of the bit and the rudder, uh, the fact that they are relatives, relatively small items that control the, the larger body, um, it's, they're both just great analogies of how our tongues affect our life's directions. James is saying that if our words are becoming more godly, the direction of our lives will become more godly. And through the middle of verse 5, James is using these positive analogies to make positive points. But then he goes kind of negative on us because he gives, he's about to give the four dangers of an out-of-control tongue. The first is that the tongue spreads evil. He uses the imagery of fire to make this point. And he uses this fiery tongue description in the context of a body, not, not the church, not the body of Christ, but the individual Christian and the damage that I can do to my own self with my tongue. And it's very easy to see. We've all seen it before. You spread gossip and no one's going to trust you. you. You'll lose friends. You speak with sarcasm and insult those around you you'll be pretty lonely because nobody wants to hang out with someone who's going to cause pain. And But even those aren't the worst implications of the spreading fire of our tongues. He's also saying that if we are hateful with our tongues, we will be hateful with other aspects of our behavior. I think about sarcasm because sarcasm can be so hateful and so damaging. I'm not sure if you know this, but the word sarcasm originally in in the Greek means to tear or rip the flesh. And so we want to be really careful that we don't use sarcasm um, because it is very destructive and it's very revealing about what our motives are. Um, And if I do not discipline and purify my speech, there's a great chance I will not discipline and purify my actions. James uses very strong words when he says an uncontrolled tongue is a world of evil. The thought here is a vast system of really bad stuff, and it implies a multitude of forms of impure speech. It corrupts the whole person. The picture is of a spreading stain that eventually leads from speech to many other wicked behaviors. It sets on fire the course of one's life. It's like James is saying the person's character is completely corrupted and it's going to last their entire lifetime. This phrase that he uses, setting uh, setting on fire the course of one's life, is a Greek phrase that's not used anywhere else in Scripture. James coined this phrase, and it would translate to us the wheel of human origin. So James is pretty serious about the far-reaching consequences of our tongues. And interestingly, he goes on and he says, it is set on fire by hell itself. I think it 
we need to realize that all of this evil that originates inside our mouths actually originates in hell. No wonder James is so concerned. And, and do we really want to give this kind of control to Satan? You know, the, the, there's a verse that says, um, out of the heart flows the issues of life. And it's talking about whatever the heart, what is going on in my heart is going to come out in my mouth, come out through my mouth. My words will reveal what is in my heart. And, and to think that that is uh, when, when I speak words that are destructive towards another person, um, it reveals that I have destruction in my heart. I have hatred in my heart. Uh, and it's a very serious matter. In verse 7 and 8, James says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Yikes. You know, domesticating all kinds of animals has been done as long as there have been people and animals, and it's continuing to be done all the time. And by using both the past tense tense of taming as well as the present tense, James is making a very strong statement concerning the complete hopelessness of permanently taming the tongue. It's, it's a very, very hopeless situation. And I think that's why in the book Celebration of Discipline, J- uh, Richard Foster is saying what we need in terms of controlling our tongues as Christians is to get away and be silent. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a silent retreat. Um, I have a couple of sisters that have have uh, utilized that uh, experience multiple times in their lives. Uh, I've never gone to one, but I think I need to because it's quite the discipline to be with friends and not be able to talk, to be disciplined with my tongue. You know, there's, let's see if I can remember this saying that was on a friend's um, Instagram, a, a, a meme that said, speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Controlling the tongue is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, we know that the the Galatian in Galatians five it lists the fruit of the spirit, and the final one is self control, and nowhere is self control more valuable than when it comes to our tongues, when it comes to our speech, um, and to allow the Holy Spirit to to be in control of what I say is huge, a huge pleasure to God that we would learn to control our speech, learn to control our tongues. Verse 9 in um, this chapter goes on to say, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James is picturing for us as Christians where we can talk really beautifully about God here at Bible study or in our churches, praising him privately or publicly, then turn around and rip into someone with our verbal lashings. It might be to their face or behind their backs, but James is said, saying that this is a non sequitur. It's, it's absolutely not realistic. It's not logical. It's, it's not to be that the same person who would praise God 
and honor him and um and or teach God's word to others and then turn around and use our tongues in a destructive manner that's a very very um it would be a very puzzling to James and and something that would be very uh, displeasing to the Lord. The other scenario for the Christian woman is how we speak to others about our husbands. Um, I think of this a lot uh, from the standpoint of when I was much younger. As we get older, we get a lot smarter in our marriages. Um, But I see often women, a woman to woman, speaking harsh things about her husband. That is so damaging and so dishonoring of our husbands. Um, if, if you have a problem in your marriage, go to a counselor. Um, but don't, don't talk about him to your friends. Don't, don't speak negatively about him because it is, it is going to um, come around in, in a way that will be destructive to your marriage and it will come around and bite you. Uh, it, it is not a smart thing to do. Um, I'm sure that James, in talking, giving these strong warnings on this topic, is remembering hearing his big brother say in Matthew twelve thirty three to 37, Make a, go- a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, but an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. Empty words? That's that's should scare us to death because I know that I speak empty words sometimes. Just useless prattle. Um, he says in verse 37, For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That is absolutely a very solemn and um, sobering statement to think that we will have to give an account for every empty word we have spoken. Matthew seven twenty, By their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Um, Did we not prophesy in your name? I mean, that, that is speaking to those of us who have presumed to be teachers, who have been called to the position of teaching others. That is prophesying. Um, We must give an account to God for what we are doing in the name of Jesus Christ. And so it's it's a very chilling and sobering reminder that someone could um, teach the Bible in the name of Jesus and Jesus say to them at the end in judgment, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. Very challenging. But let's close with Galatians five twenty-two uh, once more. But the fruit of this Holy Spirit produces love, joy, and peace. It's patient, kind, and good. It's being faithful and gentle and having control of oneself. 
Ladies, let's have control of ourselves in every area. But let's be especially careful and controlled in the area of our speech. Thank you for listening, and um, I hope you enjoy this snowy day.